Hello, I am Alfonso McGriff III, back again to talk to you about the patent process. Again, I'm downtown Hartford, the Hartford Public Library, doing a um, book festival. I'm having a book festival here, have all types of vendors selling books and many other things. We have workshops and panel discussions. Later on, at um, I think it's 2.45, we're going to be doing a Malcolm X panel discussion where we're just going to be talking about um, or asking the question, what, what are your thoughts on the impact that Malcolm X had on the national level and on the international level, being that his birthday is tomorrow. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, have a brief discussion on his impact on, uh, on people on the national level and international level. And I'm definitely gonna talk about how he influenced me most. Uh, Cause Malcolm X has had a major impact on my life. And I think he's made a lot, thing, a lot of things a lot easier. So that's at 245, from 245 to 345 in the atrium. So look forward to doing that panel discussion as well. So today, I'd like to share some information with you about the patent process. When you apply for a patent, you're applying to have the ability to own an idea for a certain amount of time. You know, 20 years, I guess. And I happened to apply for a patent. And um, I did acquire a patent. And uh, so what I want to do is share some information on the patent process. So for people who might have an idea and they think they may want to go through the patent process, you know, um, just some things to help you understand that it's a process and a part of what that process is. So the first thing that I want to say is, again, when you have an idea and you want to own it and you decide you want to apply for a patent, um, what I did initially was because I wanted to understand the process as much as possible and because I had done some research and I found how I found out how many people have had their ideas stolen from them and was nothing they could do about it. I wanted to make sure I knew as much as possible about the process so I wouldn't have something similar happen to me. And my idea is connected to what people identify as dreadlocks. So I was working in a hair salon and I do locks, I do hair and one of the things I do also is locks. And one of the complaints that I kept getting from a lot of customers is they want to grow locks, but they don't want to go through the process where their locks are all frizzy around the outside. They didn't like the frizzy part. And that's just a part of the process, you know, and as your locks get more mature, they start kind of smoothing out more, but that's a, a process and it takes time to get to that point. So I kept hearing these complaints about frizzy locks and people wanted their locks smooth and of course my mind starts going to work I'm always thinking how can I resolve that issue so one day I was curling somebody's hair with the curling iron and I was running my mouth as usual and I um put the curling iron in the wrong way and when I pressed down to get ready to curl the hair, the curling iron made this reverse mark and like, like pressed this wrinkle in their hair. And I was like, man. So I'm looking at this and I started trying to get the wrinkle out. And I eventually had to literally get a pressing comb, heat the pressing comb and then smooth that wrinkle out so that um, uh, 
you know, the curling iron could, um, I could recurl the hair and be okay. But what stayed in my mind was how almost permanent that mark was that was left in the hair and how much work I had to do to get it out. And I said, if the curling iron can just put this mark in the hair and lock it in so hard that way, maybe I can come up with some way of using heat to pack hair in, just, in, a, in, a, in a way that's just as permanent, but in a way that people would like and would want their hair packed. So I started working on my idea. I said, you know what? I got to come up with something, a way to do this. And um, one of the first things I did was there's a young lady who I knew pretty good and she had worked on some patents in her history. She's like, you know, this real brilliant person and she's worked on patents with her job and people at her school and she understood the whole process. So what I asked her to do was come with me and we sit in a hotel room away from everything and everybody and do this provisional patent. Now, a provisional patent is uh, a provisional application is the application you fill out when you want to protect your idea. Say you have this really great idea that you want to get a patent for, and you want to protect it. And it doesn't have to be detailed. You don't need professional drawings or anything. But if there are drawings associated with your idea, you want to put those drawings in, have a general understanding of what the functionality of your idea is, and you want to write down as much detail about your idea as possible. And then, this is what, again, we call a provisional patent. And so when you fill out the provisional patent, what that does is kind of put a hold on your idea for a year. And it gives you a year from the date you submit your provisional patent a year from that time to submit the actual full patent that you want. So what the provisional patent does is it kind of just gives you a general protection of your idea for a year until you fill out the um, full patent, the utilities patent. And I'm talking about a utilities patent. Utilities, how something functions. So um, we sat there and we hammered it out like in that one day and we went over everything and I still have the drawings she drew these in the hotel room that day this this sister and um, these are the original drawings the first I explained the idea to her and she did the first drawings in the hotel room that day um, for our provisional patent. And this was like a, kind of like a side view. And then this was a, 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 a view of the two like in the hair on a lock and then we had a blow up version of what the two was looking like on the lock. We did this in the hotel room that day. And these were the drawings that we connected with our initial provisional patent. So we did that on a Saturday and Sunday. No, we did that on a Sunday. And on the following Monday, you know, she left. And I sent the provisional patent off. You know what, I'm, I can't, I wish I had the date, but I don't have the date. But yeah, she 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 did the drawings, wrote it out. We 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 hammered through it, man, and, and um and got the provisional patent done. The next thing I did was I had a person who was a graphic artist, and I can tell give you the date for this because I remember when this was done. I had a person who was a graphic artist, and I asked him to 
I gave him the drawings from the provisional patent and I asked him to come up with some kind of drawing to give people some idea of what I'm talking about. And this was after the provisional hand drawing, this was the first drawing that we had that gave some idea of what the doggone tool was gonna look like. And this drawing was produced on March 21st, 1999. March 21st, 1999, when we did that drawing. So then I said that in order for me to have as much understanding as possible, I need to study this patent process. And so I went to the library, I took a week off work. I literally took a week off work. And I went to the library every day for that week, Monday through Friday and Saturday. And I stayed in the library like I was on a job. And I studied the patent process. For some people that might be a little extreme, but for me, in my mind, I just thought I had this really great idea. And I wanted to know as much about the process as possible so even when I began to apply for a patent, I would understand what was going on. So every day, I went to the library and I stayed there six to eight hours studying the patent process, the application, trying to understand exactly how this thing worked and what I need to do. At that time, the beautiful thing was, and I think it's still the case, any questions you have about the application, you can call the patent office and they'll answer your questions. It doesn't matter how many times you call, they'll answer your questions. And so I was that person, they, they knew, first name basis. Oh, it's Alfonso, yes, how can we help you? Because <laughs> I was calling about everything. I really wanted to understand this thing. So then I started doing a patent search. And I started looking for any ideas or any kind of patent associated with grooming dreadlocks. And anything connected to grooming dreadlocks using heat. And I was just looking at everything. I was, this right here, this is a notebook full of all of the pages that I printed out while I was doing the patent search at that time. And any kind of promotions that I came across that dealt with curling irons or that dealt with curling irons or uh, anything associated with heat and hair. Curling irons, pressing combs, anything. I was trying to find out if anybody else had thought about this idea that I had. And so I couldn't find anything and I didn't find anybody that had the idea that I had. So, um, one of the things I had to do was find a patent attorney. And I'm not going to name the patent attorney because we had a challenging moment. <laughs> And it was directly connected to the fact that I had worked so hard to understand the patent process. So I found a patent attorney. And the first thing the patent attorney said when I went in his office was, okay, it's gonna cost you $500 to do a patent search. I said, well, I'm not gonna pay $500 for a patent search because I've already done one. He said, well, yours is not going to be able to be as thorough as mine is. I can get into certain maybe areas that you can't. I said, well, I understand that. But I am so confident that there is nothing that exists like my tool. I'm not paying $500 for a patent search. He said, well, it, it makes no sense to go through all of this and you pay this money for this patent process and then there's something out there already. 
And I said, it makes no sense for me to pay $500 when I already know it doesn't exist. I know my business. I'm in the business of hair. You in the business of patent attorney. I know my business. As a matter of fact, at that time, I was working for hair companies. So I was traveling all over the country, traveling outside the country, at all kind of hair shows and conventions. And if there was anything like my idea that existed, not only would it be in a so-called patent search, but I'd literally see it. I'd see people utilizing it or I'd see it being promoted or something. So I was extremely confident. And I said, well, I'm not gonna pay you $500 for a patent search, so what's the next process? What do we need to do? Well, we need to fill out the paperwork on the utilities patent. I said, oh, okay. Well, I've done pretty much most of that already, too. He said, really? I said, yeah, I pulled out the paperwork. There's a good friend of mine, this brother named Robert Bryan, who sat down with me, and we went over all of the different areas where they require information about the ID and about the patent, and we did the write-up and all of this kind of stuff, and he helped me through that process. So I had filled out as much of the patent application as possible. I had done as much as possible. And um, when I couldn't do any more, like when I couldn't fill out the claims, their claims are the, um, they're like the claims that you're making to say that this is an original idea and why this is an original idea and how this functionality how this thing works and functions that makes it original. And so, so that we can give you the right to own this idea. So you definitely need a patent attorney to write your claims because if you write your claims the wrong way, you can write yourself right out of the rights for your idea. So I had pretty much done everything except the claim. And so when he was looking through, he was like, wow, man, you, you've pretty much done all of this work already. And I said, yeah, yeah, I did. So he uh, he took me on as a client, and he started working on my patent and doing the claims for me. And, uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, I had to do something a little better than these original drawings that I had for my idea and something more professional for uh, for the um, for the actual patent when you fill out the information because once you get a patent your drawings go in a database and you know and then they can see what everything's supposed to look like. So I had to get some professional drawings done. And I had nowhere, you know, I had no idea who was gonna be able to do these drawings for me or how I was gonna get them done. So I found a sister who was an architect and she used her software for architecture to actually do the drawings for my idea. And um, so I'm going to show you some of the drawings that she created. And it, and it, and it, and it ended up being pretty cool and I was kind of getting excited. So So we went from this here, and then I got a professional, to this. And she used her, her, uh, her program that she did use to design houses to actually create my tool in a three-dimensional drawing. And I thought that was like the coolest thing in the world. We went from this to this. So I um, had her 
do the drawings for me. Uh, you know, um, from these different angles and stuff. And uh, she was great to work with. Like, she, she, she kept calling my tool a comb. And that, that was kind of aggravating because <laughs> I had to keep reminding her, this is not a comb. This is, this is called a lock groomer. But anyway, she, she did a great job uh, with my artwork for my patent. So in the meantime, my lawyer, my patent attorney, is uh, writing up my patent for me. And trust me, because I did so much work myself, I saved a lot of money. Basically, the only thing that was left for him to do, in addition to uh, a few details that he needed me to, to clear up so he could have a basic understanding of how the two worked and everything, all he had to do was basically write my claims because all of the other information he needed, Brian and I had taking care of that. So, um, so anyway, there was a, there was a little point during this patent process where my patent attorney and I had some challenges. And what happened was, When I first applied for my patent and I mailed in the information and I was waiting to hear from them, 9-11 took place. Like, I mailed my patent in about a week before 9-11. That was 2001, right? So now I showed you my first drawing of my tool was from 1999. So between 1999, it took two years for me to get to the point where I actually was working on the patent process and I had created my, working on creating my tool and everything. So I, we sent the patent package in a week before 9-11 happened. What happened when 9-11 took place, all the mail like in the United States of America all of a sudden got redirected to Washington, D.C. Like everything had to go to Washington, D.C. and then get sent back out. So I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and the patent, they never get my packet with my patent application and everything. So again, today I'm explaining uh, my particular process and what I went through to acquire a patent for an idea. And so my patent attorney suggested that we put another package together and then overnight it to the patent office because all of that mail is gonna be locked up, tied up in DC forever after 9-11. So that's what we did. We waited about a month, patent office never received it just assumed it got lost in the mail, put together another package, overnighted it to patent office, and they, they did receive the information finally. Uh, and then, you know, of course, I was, I was already known on a first-hand basis because I was calling them about every single question possible. You know, oh, okay, this is all fine, so yeah. And I mean, I knew at least like two or three people who, when they answered the phone, they just knew it was me because I will call so much to, to, to understand this process. So, okay, now I got my patent mailed in, all done. That was 2001. About 2003 or four, I heard from them. It took almost like two years. 
When I finally heard from them, they rejected my patent application. And the thing about the patent process is they always reject your first application. They're going to find just the most minuscule anything reason to reject it. I mean, you got to be so tight for them not to reject it the first time. So I was like devastated. I was like, oh, I thought I was going to get a patent, you know. So patent attorney explained to me, well, no, you just got to make some changes, whatever. And, and what, they, what the patent office does is they send you a copy of the patents that they believe your idea might be infringing on. So when I looked, I realized one of the patents they sent them was somebody had what they call a braid sealer. And like people using synthetic hair to braid, they would put this in the oven and then clamp it at the bottom and it would cut the braid off at the bottom. So it would seal the braid. And so we had to change our language a little bit so that the patent office understood that we didn't have a closure blade an opening and a closure blade. We had an entrance and an exit, which is how our tool was made. So we changed the language so that we understood that my tool had an entrance and an exit. So I was looking at the information he was about to send. And I was like, dude, you, you left out the drawing. Why did you do that? So he kind of chuckled in my face like, you know, like you don't understand that this, I just, you know, it's going to be some things that we're going to do and we, we're trying to get you a patent. I said, but no, no, see, he didn't really understand how hard I had worked. Like, all I could look at him and say, you don't understand. I'm not asking you to be my hero. I'm paying you to do a job. You can't just make changes in my stuff without letting me know, man. And this dude just chuckled in my face again like, like I don't understand. But he was like in total violation. Right? You know, I mean, like before I saw you, I, I had already been in this for about a year, dude. You can't make changes without saying something to me. So he laughed at me again, like I was in his office. And I said, no, I need to have a chat with this man. And it, I can't do it in the office because he has no idea how high my temperature is right now. This dude laughed in my face two times about my stuff. So I left. This was in 2000. This was a in 2004 around that time they still had telephone booths I left his office and drove to the nearest telephone booth and I called him up and I think people may have heard me for a block or two and I used some incredibly choice language trying to help him understand this is my life dude you don't make changes in my life without letting me know this I'm hiring you to do something you can't just change my stuff without telling me you know and I, I, I you know you know back then I was a little more excitable so, <laughs> so anyway I hung the phone up the next day I got an email from him resigning as my attorney so I called him back and I said, hey, I see you, you don't understand me, man. I told you, I studied this whole process. I took a week off of work. I went in the library every day like it was a job for a week. And one of the other things I read while I was doing my research is it's illegal for an attorney to resign in the middle of the patent process. You can't quit. It's illegal. So all you got to do is just understand what I was saying. And then we can proceed because I'm done with it. But you kind of sniggled in my face twice while trying to help you understand me. So I had to do it another way. 
So let's go on and proceed on and, and do this. So now my antennas are up because he tried to quit on me. But then he he realized I knew what I was talking about because you it's illegal to quit in the middle of the process. Especially if you know you've been paid, you can't quit. So if I hadn't studied my information, I wouldn't have known that he can't quit on me. But I did. So now I don't trust him. So then there were these two ladies that worked at the office that were familiar with me. And he tried to, when he got mad, he sent another package in. And I guess he was trying to include the drawing that I cussed him out about. But I don't know what else he might have changed from what we sent them before, from what he sent them before for us to try to get the patent, uh, the patent through. So I called the office and I said, whatever that last package is he sent, just throw that in the garbage. We're gonna go with the one, um, I called it, the, run, the one he sent pre-cussing out rather than the one he sent post-cussing out. <laughs> so, <laughs> So the ladies, you know, they kind of laughed. I said, listen, that last one, throw it out. Let's use the one that he sent before I cussed him out. And that one eventually is the one that went through and I got the patent. I don't know what that final one was. It could have been the exact same thing with the drawings that he took out without telling me. I don't know. I just didn't trust it. So anyway, the patent went through. And the, the other thing that helped me is I had a relationship with the people at the office where I could literally tell them, just don't pay attention to that last one. So anyway, so finally I got the information and I, I received my patent. And like, like, I'm the happiest person in the world. Like I own my idea. I own it, it's mine for 20 years. Now the challenge is how do I how do I get this thing produced? How do I make it? Because all I have are really cool drawings. And um, I connected with a person again in China who had done some. I knew had done some stuff for some people, and I, I got in touch with him. I said I need to have this made. This is from scratch. This I have a patent for. It's a brand new idea. Nobody never saw it before and we need to take this from my mind into reality and he was like okay but we need drawings with the specific lengths and measurements and all of this other kind of stuff so now I have to take these drawings that I showed you earlier And I have to go get get them redone with measurements. This was the very first drawing of my my idea right here for for grooming dreadlocks. Then I found a, a architect who used her software that she did for architect to to create a professional drawing of my tool. And it's, it's amazing when you're trying to get something out of your head into somebody else's so they'll understand how to produce it. This is one heck of a process. So now I need drawings with measurements for the company because I found a company who said they can do it. And all of the companies in America, they just were outrageous. I mean, they were, they were totally outrageous. So... I now I find a company who can make it. So this is what I did. I went back to the architect, and then she did the drawings. It was five different tools, with five different sizes, and she did the drawings with me with measurements and everything for the company. Because you, you know, I mean, these people were very, very detailed, which I liked about them. This company in China who actually made my tools. And, um, and so she did professional renderings with measurements for each of the tools. 
So again, we're talking about the patent process. And now I send these off to China. And help them to understand the material that it's made out of. I said, I said, you know those big black frying pans black people use to fry fish in? I said, what is that material right there? <laughs> um, cast iron, I said, well, that's what these need to be made out of. The same kind of material, similar to that. And then I sent them curling irons that I use in a hair salon because when you, again, I was speaking earlier, when you're talking to somebody who's speaking a different language, sometimes it's just best to just show them what you need because the, the, the language just get all twisted. So I sent them some curling irons. I said, you know the cast iron pan? I said, these are some curling irons. The same material these are made out of. So they went to their, uh, their, uh, chemists and stuff and tested the material and literally was telling me that what the material was made of and what percentage of what was in the material. And I was like, well, that's great information. Even though all I cared about is can you make it, man? Can you use the same kind of stuff we use for these curl knives? So they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so we have the drawings. We have the measurements. We have the material. We have the deposit. We ready to roll. We are ready Roll. Now in the interim, one of the things I didn't tell you was I went to a black company to try to have them make my tool first. Because at the time I was like, you know, I know this one black company and they make curling irons, maybe they can make my tool. So I called them up. And they in Compton, California. I called them up. I said, hey, I have this tool. I just got a patent for it. I'm trying to have it produced. I want to know if y'all can make it. So they said, well, you know, where are you from? I said, I'm in, I'm in Hartford, Connecticut. And they were like, well, you know, well, make an appointment and come on in and, you know, we can see. I said, okay, cool. Man, I made an appointment. I got a plane ticket, flew the dog on California, took the cab to Compton, this probably like two or three weeks later, and I'm sitting in this office of this brother, Compton, California, and the secretary is, hi, how are you? I said, I had an appointment such such time. You know, I, I, had, I had, it was a long journey. So. I said, I had an appointment to speak to this guy about making a tool for me. She was like, oh, really? I said, yeah. She looked in the book. My name was in there. I was on time. And so now the owner, the guy who I talked to on the phone, he comes out. And he's obviously shocked because what? I don't know why he didn't think I was going to come to California and make this appointment. But he was shocked. He was caught off guard. He thought I was just talking like somebody, you know, sometimes people think you're just babbling. They don't know you're serious and they don't take you serious. So when I was sitting in his office from Connecticut, now he felt obligated to show me around his company. So he showed me around his company. He told me how, how he had trained this guy and helped him learn how to make, how to do the whole process and everything. Then the guy went and got somebody to finance him and started his own company and ended up being his main competitor, you know. And so I'm like, now I'm dealing with a brother that ain't got much trust. So after he showed me around and everything, because he felt obligated to because I showed up there, he was like, well, you know, I'm kind of caught up in what I'm doing here and I don't think I'm going to really be able to facilitate making your tool for you and this stuff. I was like devastated, right? I'm, I'm, I'm devastated. So I get back on the bus. I know I get back on the, go back to the hotel. I don't even look at nothing in California. I, I had flew out there because I was, that was what I was there for. I went back to the hotel and I didn't leave there until it was time to get on the plane. I ain't even, at that point, I, I didn't even experience what 
the West Coast was about. I had been back there a couple of times since, but that was, you know, that was my first time. I was devastated. I was devastated all the way back home on the plane. So I um, was talking to some of my friends, and I, I was like, man, you know, it's crazy. This dude, I flew all the way out there, and this dude had me. He didn't take me serious. But he told me one thing. He said, listen, do you have a prototype? And I looked at him. I said, I don't need a prototype. I know it's going to work. I know. I said, I've done it in my head a thousand times. I know this is going to work when I get it made. He said, well, what I would suggest you do when you get back home is get a prototype made and test it. So I was just thinking he was just talking, man, you know, just to act like he giving me some advice because he didn't take me serious. So I came back home and I told, you know, you know, and then you got your friends who got your back and they just want to wait and wait for you to get back so you can tell them what happened in California and everything. I was like, man, I went down there. That dude ain't take me serious. He showed me his thing. And then after he showed me around his factory, he said he couldn't do it for me. So he said, I said, but he did tell me to make a prototype. But I already know how it's going to work. So there was an older guy. He's always been like a mentor. And he was like, well, maybe you should make a prototype. I said, I don't need a prototype, man. I know how it's going to work. He said, Maybe you should have a prototype made. I said, okay, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I have a prototype made. So I had a relative who, who was a principal of a vocational technical high school. So I went to him. I said, I need these curling irons cut up in a certain way and reattached to create this tool that I need to make for a prototype. So he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, they're going to charge you certain amount of money, you know, you pay them what they ask for, you should be able to get it done, no problem. I said, okay, cool. So I went and talked to the shop master, told him what I wanted, brought the curl lines to him, and he he uh, he made two prototypes for me. And these were the two prototypes he made. I still have them. I mean, these, these are rough, but these were the two prototypes he made. Can you come get these and just pass it back there so people can look at them? And these prototypes are made from curling irons that were cut up and then reattached so they would serve the purpose of what I um, was trying to get done. And again, this is a tool that I created to smooth and pack dreadlocks for people that like their locks neat. So I made the prototype. Guess what, right? I start using the prototype, and it's not working the way I imagined. So I'm, 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 I'm using it on locks, and I'm sliding it down, and the prototype is not working. Do you realize it took me a year to figure out what I was doing wrong? After getting frustrated, Locks not looking the way I wanted them to. One night, about midnight, I was cleaning up in the salon, and one of my young cousins came through with some locks, and he's just sat in a chair. It's like 12 o'clock at night. He said, and I'm tired. I've been working all day. He's like, yo, man, why don't you use your tool on my locks? And I'm a little discouraged because it just hasn't been looking right. So... I said, yeah, sit down, sit down. Let me just grab this thing and see what's happening. And what I had been doing for a year was sliding this tool down and packing, trying to pack the hair like this. And that seemed theoretically like it would work, but it just didn't look right. It didn't have something was wrong. This particular night, midnight, I'm at the peak of tired. He sits down. I grabbed the tool, put some product on his lock, and I put the tool in his hair, and then I rolled his lock. And then as I'm sliding and I'm turning it, I'm just rolling his lock between my fingers. And it was just the most beautiful sight you ever saw. I said, I cannot believe it took me a whole year to figure out that I have to turn and roll the lock as I'm sliding the tool. And that hair just 
that hair just wrapped right around that lock so tight and nice and then it looked really good and aesthetically it was nice and it was like the most incredible eureka moment and um wow man and that told me that that's why i went to california i didn't go to california to get the tool made i went to california for him to tell me to make a prototype because I never thought in my mind I needed one. And then when he told me, I confirmed myself not needing one. And then when I found out it wasn't working right, I was like, wow, I needed one. And then when I found out how to actually make it work, I knew that was my value in going to California, which is beautiful, you know, because it's, it's cool when you find out why you do things, even sometimes you don't understand why something happened till later on down the road. Because I thought it was the most wasted trip in the history of trips. And to this day, that was one of my most valuable trips, flying out to California for him to tell me to make a prototype. So part of the process, I flew back to California because I met another guy at a hair show. And he was the curl and iron guy. So I told him I'm looking for a company to make my tool. And this particular guy in California, he made this one. Can you grab this one? He made this one, a guy in California, he was starting a company, he made that one. And again, it, that was a disappointing experience because after he made that one and we agreed that he was gonna make my tool for me, he disappeared. And that's how I wound up uh, dealing with the company in China. Because the first guy said he couldn't do it for me. The next guy said he could, and then he disappeared. And then um, I, I finally settled in on China. Now, China sent back the first prototypes for me and they weren't right okay I'm gonna need you again son they weren't right because the outer edge didn't curl out the way my drawings did so these were the first ones they sent me and that outer rim was supposed to kind of flare out a little bit but it just went straight across so then they sent me these drawings and said, is this what you mean, how you want it? And they used some clay and stuff and created the pictures and took the pictures and sent those back to me and said, that flare that you're asking for, is that what you referring to? And I told him, yes, I need that flare. Can you, I need the paper back here. I need that flare. So then they finally sent me, after us going through this to get the flare that I needed, them sending me, I mean, you know, this is an incredible process. You know, and, and then again, this is coming from my head and we're trying to make manifest this thing into reality. So when they sent me, just giving me some idea how they do things, when they sent me these pictures about how, okay, is this the flare you're talking about? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's the flare I'm talking about. I was like, man, this is serious, man. These people ain't playing. So they, um, they, they, they got the flare right. They sent me a prototype with the flare. And then we had to start talking about packaging materials and how the tool was going to be packaged. And they sent me some different um, ideas of how the tool would be packaged and what, what I want, you know, asking me what I wanted and how did I want it to be packaged. And uh, so we went through that process and we finally settled in on something similar to this. And this was the final product 
with the proper flair and the packaging and the whole nine. These are called McGriff's Original Lock Groomers. And these I use to groom locks. These two on the end are short for people when they're first starting their locks and if they want them groomed, they can still get theirs groomed as well. So when they're going through that rough patch in the beginning and they're real fluffy, they can still get their locks groomed too. And then these were different sizes in diameter for different size locks. And then I had to think of ways how I wanted to advertise. I had a, a graphic artist come up with a logo for me called McGriff's Original Lock Groomer. And then this is what we use to, to promote the tool, McGriff's Original Lock Groomer. And then I also, I also uh, was, was considering developing a product line specifically for the lock groomer. And this was a logo that, was that, that we developed for the product, uh, the product line. It was called Nati, Nati Dread Lock Groomer. And it was, it was going to be the spray, the shampoo, the conditioner, whatever. And that kind of thing. These are also some computer generated drawings that they sent me when we were first developing the proper style or curvature associated with how the tool was going to be made. And it's just, it's just pretty incredible to know all of the different things that you go through. Now, I had no idea I was going to go through all of this stuff. Um, and, and getting a, a patent and getting a tool made. But it's just a part of the process. But you never know. You just start and then you start filling in and doing everything necessary that you, you need to do to get it done. And then finally, this is a, a copy of the actual patent that I eventually received for the tool with the drawings that the, the, the woman made for me. And um, and then some promotional cards that I created to help begin to to sell the two. McGriff's original lock boomer. So this is, uh, again, just a workshop where I was discussing a part of the patent process and what it took for me to um, eventually go from an idea again, go from an idea into bringing something into fruition. And so that's, that's again, uh, some information on the patent process. Now the question I have is do, do, do you all have any questions about some of this information that I've shared about the patent process? Not so much about the process, but what about, how do you heat the comb? Uh, like a, in a, the way I had them designed, I measured them so that they would already fit into the same kind of stove the curling irons go into. Yeah. My, my, mother, my mother used to do it, that's why I was familiar with, with the small Yeah, the small stove. Yeah. You, it's already set up, you put the curl irons in. And these, these go right in the right same in thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the question. Well, the passion of not like the actual product. Yeah. Like, 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 well, they're for anybody who's interested in learning how to use them. Because just like curl irons, professionals use curl irons, but mm -hmm. people that yeah. use curl irons at home uh, use them too once they, you learn how to use them. So from start to finish, when you first, first started your patent process until you got the final approved patent, how long was that? We started in 2001, but the patent date when we got the patent is right on the front cover of that. 
Yeah. When you say the patent attorney helped write the claims, does that include like the description and all the rest? I, of the I had done mostly part. all the description and all of that other stuff. Oh, okay. The most the patent attorney did was write the claims, and he needed to understand how the tool worked in order to write claims that would be beneficial to me. Because sometimes when you're writing claims, if they're too specific, then you protect that specificity and somebody, somebody, somebody can go around by just right. changing a measurement or something like that. And then you want to, if, you, if you're too broad, then you don't define the utility of what your tool is. You're not really defining what your functionality is and what your idea is. So that's the patent attorney. That's where their artwork comes in, when they start doing the claims for you so that you can truly be protected and they're not too specific and they're not too broad. Any other question? Well, I just want to say I appreciate y'all for sitting in on this information about the patent process. And um, I hope some of this information can help you as you come up with these great ideas and you want to own your ideas for like 20 years. And um, it's only good for 20 years? Yep. So you have to refile in like 15 years? Or no, it's a wrap. After 20, it's a wrap. Get all, get all your work for 20. Years. Get all your work for 20. Then it's wide open. And even during that 20, you got to keep paying these increasing maintenance fees to maintain the patent. You know. three years, and then you come Yeah, three, and then seven, and then, you know, 12 or something like that. After 20 years, it's not good anymore. After 20 years, it's still your idea, but now it's wide open for anybody else. Yeah. You own the rights for 20 years. After that 20, it's wide open. How well received is this among the, the, the Jack community? The folks are, folks are... That's another experience. And yeah, the I'm question was... About my brother, I have a brother who has brand new growing tests. Maybe 1983, probably down to 90. And I look at this and I don't know. I mean, I don't, don't think it would be practical for somebody who has hair that long. Yeah. Because by then, you know, your hair kind of starts packing itself and getting yeah. eaten. But let me tell you a quick story about when I first, I, I first introduced this tool to the world in 2011. And I introduced it to the world via a, a video on YouTube. And when I first went to hair shows and started introducing this, in 2011, 29, in 2009 to 2011, black people made natural hair a religion. It became very, very sacred. And, and locks at that time were the same way. It was almost like a, a religion. You know, and people who had it, they were just so intense and so serious. So when I introduced this tool, introduced using heat on locks, all hell broke in. Man, I'm they cussed me out so bad. Up and down and down. I, I mean, they, I had one of the, the, the guy I respected in the locking industry, he's one of the major dudes, he said, that thing will be successful over my dead body. The venom, I can't even, the only thing I can help you understand say to you to help you understand how deep the venom was is that I um I had to leave the tool alone to keep from hating black people. I stopped promoting it, everything. I totally just moved to something else because the pain was too intense. I thought somebody would be appreciative because it's like you got an idea you own. You 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 got a patent bro you 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 created a tool. No, none of that. So, as I close real quick, I left it alone. And from 2011 to about 2017, that video had 7,000 views total. Something happened in 2017 where those views started going up and going up and going up, and then people start ordering the tool. Because I, I had them sitting in the garage. People start ordering the tool. And I don't know what happened, but I didn't promote it, still haven't promoted it. And, and now I'm sending out orders almost every week. 
and it has over almost 400,000 views now between 2017 and now. So some things changed, it became more acceptable, maybe I was just too soon for the time or whatever, but I, I had to fall completely back because because uh, I was... Yeah. So anyway, listen, I want to thank y'all for hanging in for this, yes. What made you decide to use the heat for that tour? Use the heat? What made you decide there was a need for the tour? Because I was doing locks and people kept complaining about the frizzies. And, but I do regular hair too, so I'm using the curling iron all the time. And then I finally saw a connection where I could, if I could rearrange this thing and then use it for locks, I could pack the hair neat and get rid of the frizzies. So that's what now, I did. did that change the texture of the lock at all? No. As a matter of fact, it made the lock a lot stronger. Because up until then, a lot of people were shaped, cutting the, cutting the frizzies off with scissors. Then the locks get weak spots and all of that kind of stuff. And the more the hair that packs in, the stronger the lock is. So when you're cutting it and trimming it and all that other kind of stuff, you know, you, you kind of uh, taken away from the strength of the lock. So I got to end this workshop. Again, I want to thank y'all for sitting in and listening to me run my mouth. I hope you can get something out of it. And um, uh, just sharing my experience with the patent process. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful rest of y'all day, afternoon, evening. <laughs>